meditating on a few verses in Romans 12 about three, four weeks ago. And then I just kind of noticed how the next thing related to that and the next thing related to that. And even I, as dumb as I am, I was smart enough to know I couldn't fit that into one <laughs> sermon. And so we will try to finish it today. This is our third message on Romans 12. Um, and what we talked about, the first uh, message we talked about, um, we uh, it was about the body. Um, and uh, then the second uh message was about the needs of the body, and now this uh, message is going to be about the mindset of the body. As I was looking through the passage, I did see that it kind of divided up, um, well, yeah, the first message was called yeah, the member, many members in one body, but it kind of divided up into three general sections um, as far as the kind of the focus or the main point. Um, is this too loud? Okay, all right. Sometimes um, I will be preaching, and then without meaning to, I'll get a little far from the mic, and then my mouth, my, my mouth, my tone of voice will drop, and then sometimes you'll miss things. So because of that, I try to have it uh, loud enough there right here. Okay, so uh, Romans 12, and I'm going to read verses uh, 14 through 21. Um, and so uh, in this section here, of course, we know in Romans 12, the, the first two verses are very well known. talks about uh, presenting your body as a living sacrifice to yield yourself to God. talks about don't be conformed to this world. Don't, don't get your ideas from the world on how you're supposed to be. Be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Means you'll get God's word in your mind, and that will teach you how you're supposed to be. And then... It says so you can prove God's will for your life, and that's a very, very important. But then in verse uh, 3, he talks about how we shouldn't think more highly than we ought to think, but think soberly, because God has dealt to every man a measure, the measure of faith. And that's, that was an interesting concept to me. I never really thought about it until I preached on this passage, that he was saying the gifts that you have, the abilities that you have, they actually are because God gave you the faith to do that. And so Paul is saying, don't think I'm so great. No, it's a gift. God gave you some kind of an ability. Don't think, I'm so great because I got this great gift. Instead, think, okay, God gave me the faith to do this, so I'm going to do this. And he basically said, don't be looking at everybody else and thinking, yours is better or yours is less and theirs is better. But just focus on the faith God gave you and then practice that. And then he gives examples of some different kinds of gifts and, and how you would practice that according to the proportion of your faith. And we talked about that two Sundays ago. And then last Sunday, we talked about verses 9 through uh, 13. And, and we, we, we called it the, um, let me see, what did I call it? The, uh, the needs of the body. And if you look in that passage, it focuses much more on how we treat one another in church. Um, but then if you look in verse 14, it says, bless them with which persecute you. Now, I know sometimes Christians persecute each other. That does happen. However, that's really not the norm. <laughs> and so you can see when he says, bless them which persecute you, He's relating more to how we look at people outside the body of Christ, how we look at people out there in the world, whether it's vaccine mandates or whatever, how we look at people outside. The world is constantly putting pressure on Christians to change and become like them. You know, It's not just that we want people to change and become like God and to live according to the Bible. We have that desire, but they have another desire. They want us to change and become like them. And that's why there's this tension. That's why there's persecution. Jesus said, if the world hate you, it hated me before it hated you. Okay, and so that persecution, that pressure that we feel, here's the danger. Just like if we're not focused on the needs of the body, we talked about last week, there's a danger that the body will suffer because we're not thinking of others and trying to help one another. Or the danger also that we would um, not understand, that we would think more highly of ourselves than we ought to think. But then there's another danger, and that is even if we're united as God's people and we're edifying one another in the body and we're being humble and trying to serve God and encourage one another, there, there is a danger, and this can happen. And I have seen this happen in many churches where they're really taking care of each other, but they get so inwardly focused and so ingrown and so like um, our little group, us four and no more, that they, we, we lose our vision for why we're here, which is to reach the lost, is to reach the people out there. That's actually why we're here. An example would be a person who, who is in, whose body is in perfect health. I mean, they go to the gym every day, and they pump iron, and they're just, they're, they're, and they always eat like sprouts and whole grains, and they, they, and they, they are just, they know how to be really healthy, and they're just the lean, mean machine, and they do maybe videos on YouTube, whatever, teaching you how you can be healthier. 
And that reminds me, I never came and picked up that uh, that yeah. that Chuck Norris. He's gonna make me total into Chuck gym. Norris, right? Total yeah. total gym, yeah. So well, I need to remember what's that? I don't know about Chuck Norris. <laughs> so, well, I, I could be better than Chuck Norris because he's like eighty now, right? Yeah. There's always a change. Well, you're halfway there. Exactly. Yeah. <laughs> so, um, so you know, you could you can get you could be the fittest, healthiest jerk that ever walked the face of the earth. Isn't that true? I mean, you could be healthy, hardworking, and totally fit. I mean, you have a body that somebody else would kill for. And then you might kill somebody else. You know what I'm trying to say? Like, it's not enough to just take care of your body. Your body has a purpose, doesn't it? It's to go out and do something and make the world a better place. Or if you're a Christian, it's to win people to Christ. Now I'm talking about your physical body, right? And work that you need to do. You have a purpose in life. Your goal in life is not just to be healthy. That's the first part, because how can you help others if you're struggling, if you're suffering? So yes, you do want to be healthy. Now I'm just talking the physical here and apply it to the spiritual. But you really need to... Uh, uh, not just focus on your own body's health, which is what the message was about last week, the needs of the body, but now we have to think, okay, so why are we here? And the answer is, Jesus said, go into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. We're here because we are on a mission. We're fighting the devil, and we're trying to rescue people from the power of the devil, and we're trying to spread a message to every creature, and not everybody's going to accept it, and there's going to be persecution. And so that's what Paul's doing here. As he started out talking about don't take, think too highly of yourself, then he, start, then he says, uh, learn how to meet the needs of the body. And now he says, bless them which persecute you. Now he's saying, okay, now I want you to pivot and start thinking about how you treat people outside the church. And that's why this is a separate message, because even though it's all relating to the body, it's a, each one is a different focus, all right? And so this is called, I call this the mindset of the body. So it's what kind of a mindset do we have? What is our purpose? What is our focus? Once we have understood and done the best we can to exhort and encourage and strengthen one another and meet the needs of people in the body. But it's not just about that because there are churches where they become an end in themselves, where it's just like we got our little group and, you know, we're not too sure about anybody that walks in. And I don't know if we want to mess it up, you know, by some struggling sinner. You know, <laughs> newsflash, <laughs> struggling sinners is all that we have in here. <laughs> but anyway, but you know, that, that can happen. That can happen where the church becomes like a little exclusive club, all right? And yet that's the completely opposite. Jesus, he spent time with the most struggling people, and he said, they that are whole, you got a physician, they that are sick. And I'll tell you something. You know, I like to pick on homeschoolers because I, I is one. <laughs> well, um... There was a time in my life where I didn't understand this. I really felt like we needed just to protect ourselves and protect our children from the world. Now, I still believe that we, because our children are not fully mature yet, that we need to be careful about allowing them to have any influence, just any influence. We do need to protect them. That's not wrong. But there's something that I thought that I realize now is not correct. It completely disagrees with the Bible. It's more logic. There's so many ideas in our head that are just logic, but they're not truth. They're not biblical truth. And I have seen so many homeschool families isolate themselves from everybody so that they don't get contaminated. Only for the worst possible sins to show up right in that family when they're all by themselves in the woods somewhere. Because you know what? They couldn't run from the devil, and they couldn't run from their sin nature. And the Apostle Paul says, I know that in me, that is my flesh, is well, no good thing. And there's homeschoolers are like, I know that in America and in the culture and in Hollywood, there's no, there's no good thing. No, the Bible says, in me, that is in my flesh, it dwells no good thing. Now, even though that's true, that you have a duty, he that walketh with wise men shall be wise, but a companion of fools shall be destroyed. And even though it's true that you have a duty to protect your children and yourself from wrong influences, that is true. It's also true that our entire calling is to reach the world with the gospel. And so one of the things that I didn't understand in the past was this. As a homeschool dad, Yes, I'm going to protect my kids. And I'm probably the most protective parent in this room. So I'm not um, telling you not to protect your kids. <laughs> but as a homeschool dad who wants to protect my children from worldly influences and myself, I have to recognize something. I will be the most protected when I am obeying God. And if God tells me I'm supposed to be reaching the world with the gospel, I'm and I don't do that, I'm being a disobedient child of God. And one of the pieces of armor is the feet shod with the preparation of the gospel of peace. And you have to put on the whole armor of God that you may be able to stand against the wiles of the devil. Part of that armor is sharing the gospel. 
is wanting to reach other people and help other people. So I have to recognize that actually, even though I will protect, and I do continue to protect my children from wrong influences as best as I can, actually, part of my children being able to serve God is number one, that they're plugged into the body of Christ themselves, that they're not just relating straight to their parents, but they're being helped by other members of the body, number one. And number two, that they are seeing me obey the Great Commission to reach the world with the gospel, and then they themselves are getting inspired and excited to obey the Great Commission. And homeschoolers, many, not all, many great homeschool families, but many homeschool families lost that. They completely threw out the Great Commission. And that's basically completely missing the point of why we're here. Folks, we're not here just to hang on till the rapture and try to keep our nose clean. We're here to fight the devil, to encourage and edify one another, and we're here to try to reach the world for Christ. That's why we're here. The purpose of the protections we put in our families, and the purpose, is, purpose of the trying to avoid and separate from sin, the purpose of that is so we'll be better equipped to reach the world with the gospel. And so we have to remember that. And so that's the mindset. Okay, we talked about the needs. We talked about many members, one body. We talked about the needs of the body. Now we're talking about the mindset. What is the mindset as a Christian? What is our mindset? What is our mindset as a church? Yes, we need to think about the needs and administer the needs. But there's a proper mindset, a proper way of thinking that we have to have. And we're only going to get it from the Bible. We're not going to get it online or Fox News or definitely not going to get it on MSDNC or any of those places. And we're not going to get it just from a pastor either. We're going to get it from the Word of God. So we're all going to the Word of God today to find out what is the mindset of the body. How are Christians supposed to think about their calling as a body? Okay. And so first of all, he says this, Bless them which persecute you, bless and curse not. And he says, Rejoice with them that do rejoice and weep with them that weep. He says, Be of the same mind one toward another. Mind not high things, but condescend to men of low estate. Be not wise in your own conceits. Recompense to no man evil for evil. Provide things honest in the sight of all men. If it be possible, as much as lieth in you, live peaceably with all men. Dearly beloved, avenge not yourselves, but rather give place unto wrath. For it is written, vengeance is mine, I will repay, saith the Lord. Therefore, if thine enemy hunger, feed him. If he thirst, give him drink. For in so doing, thou shalt heap coals of fire on his head. Closing statement. Be not overcome of evil, but overcome evil with good. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, this is important. There has never been a time where this teaching was more needed than in 2021 in the United States of America. We're feeling besieged, we're feeling attacked, we're feeling under pressure, we're feeling persecuted, and we are being. All those things are happening to us. But Father, that's, this is nothing new. They were facing that in the Roman Empire back then. This is written to the Romans. They were facing that among the Jews. The Jews were stoning Stephen, stoning Paul. They faced it back then. It's nothing new. But Father, it is critical. It is so important that we grasp and understand what is our mindset? How are we to think every day? Father, I pray that today we will have the courage to cast down imaginations and every high thing that exalts itself against the knowledge of God and take every thought captive the obedience of Christ. Father, we need the right mindset and our minds go in a wrong direction because we are carnal, we're fleshly and we live more under fear and more with a desire to revenge. And so, Father, I pray that we would have the right mindset today. I pray you'd open our eyes and you would show us that we would humble ourselves and we would allow your word, not me, but your word, <clears throat> to be applied to our lives and that we would have a different perspective when we leave here today than when we came. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. The mindset of the body, first of all, is a blessing mindset. A blessing mindset. He says in verse 14, Bless them which persecute you. Bless and curse not. Now, he wasn't saying, don't say swear words. Now, there's a passage that says, Let no 
corrupt communication proceed out of your mouth. And the Bible says, on the day of judgment, men shall render account for every careless word they utter. It is true that we will be judged for our words and that God does not want us to speak words that in whatever language and culture we're in are considered inappropriate words. Yes, so Christians should not swear. You got that. This passage doesn't talk about that, though. It says, bless them which persecute you, bless and curse not. You understand, blessing and cursing are opposites. <laughs> to bless someone is to speak good words to them and to desire what's best for them. That's to bless. But he says, bless them which persecute you. Well, Pastor Hunter, how do I bless someone who's taken away my constitutional rights? He's persecuting me. How do I bless him? Well, you don't have to agree with someone or let them take away your constitutional rights because you're a citizen of the United States of America and you can stand up for your rights and you may suffer for it. But you and I may suffer for all kinds of things as a Christian. The Bible promises us persecution. So how do I bless the person that's persecuting me? Thankfully, the courts are probably on our side, and so we probably won't have to get to that point where we actually get persecuted. But it could happen. I, I never say never anymore. <laughs> it could happen. But uh, even if that particular area that we're concerned about right now doesn't come to pass because we have checks and balances in our system, and praise God for our system of government. Amazing how God just gave wisdom to our founding fathers. And the fact that we actually have still have some freedoms today, it's amazing. But beyond that, just the way the world attacks us, the way the world persecutes us, the way the world questions us, the way all of those things, that pressure that we feel from the culture, even as simple as, you know, the neighbor kids or relatives telling your kids that your parents are too strict and then you're dealing with that constant psychological where you're trying to raise your kids for God, but then they're hearing something different and they don't know which should I believe, what's true, what's not. And maybe even other kids in the church, their parents give them different rules and you're trying to do what's right. And then you hear all different things from people and then, and uh, people question the Bible and they teach evolution. I mean, it's, it's everywhere. The homeschooling, that's the whole reason for it, is that we're constantly dealing with the culture, attacking, uh, attacking us, questioning us, and undermining our faith, undermining our walk in every area. How do we bless those people? Well, what does it mean to bless? It means to speak good words to others and to desire what's best for them. To curse someone would be to speak negative words. In fact, if you look up those words in the original language, bless means to speak evil. Or, I'm sorry, to speak good. <laughs> and curse means to speak evil. That's literally, it's good speaking and bad speaking. That's literally what bless and curse means. Um, well, it, it's speaking good words to others and desiring what's best for them. Now, that's not agreeing with what they're doing that's wrong. No. If you agree with someone who's persecuting you and say, you're right, I'm wrong, you won't get persecuted anymore. But now you gave up on your own beliefs. <laughs> no, what it's doing is it's speaking words to them that's for their good that God wants you to speak to them. And basically, it's as simple as you're trying to share the gospel with them. You're trying to show the love of Christ to them because you want to win them Christ and desiring what's best for them, which means you want them to be saved. And it's not that you give them a five-minute gospel presentation if they reject you. Go, okay, I did that, done with that. Okay, now I don't have to treat you nice anymore. <laughs> no, it's a long-term thing to win people to Christ, isn't it? It's a long-term thing to have a good reputation as a, as a church. So a blessing mindset. This is important. We can feel surrounded. We can feel overwhelmed. We can feel outnumbered. And fear can set in. When that fear sets in, we just look at those people as they're our enemy. They're out to get us. They're up to no good. And our only thought process becomes, you know, fight or flight. And the Bible says, no, those people aren't your enemy. The devil's your enemy. We're going to talk a little more about this later on in the message. But those people aren't your enemy. The devil's your enemy. And so what are you going to say? What are you going to think when you look at that person, what's your mindset going to be? Your mindset is, Lord, that person is lost and they need salvation. And I'm going to show them the love of Christ, even though they're mistreating me. That's the mindset. I'm not saying if someone comes to your house to hurt your family, you can't defend yourself. There's a biblical basis for self-defense. Okay, I'm talking about your attitude, your mindset, not just toward government but even toward unsaved people you work with or unsaved friends and relatives 
What's our mindset? Why are we here? We're here to give the gospel. We're here to give the good news. <laughs> we're not here to just circle our wagons and wait for the rapture. That's not what we're here for. And we have to have the right mindset because the whole reason we are a body is so we can reach the world with the gospel. And if we descend into fear and anger and confusion and chaos, we will not fulfill God's will. We won't fulfill his purpose for our life. So that no matter what happens, and you have your constitutional right to self-defense, and you have your constitutional right to resist tyranny. I'm not against any of that. But beyond all of that, you still have the primary duty of desiring that those people would be saved and praying for their salvation and sharing the gospel with them. We have to have the right mindset. So number one, a blessing mindset. To bless means to speak good words to others and desire what's best for them. Number two is a sympathy mindset. This is verse 15. It says, Rejoice with them that re re do rejoice and weep with them that weep. Now I'm afraid <laughs> that God's people, very often we don't obey that verse. Very often what we do is when someone's rejoicing, in other words, something good's happening to them and things aren't going so good for us, rather than rejoicing with them, we become jealous of them. Even Christians, sadly. If you're having struggles in your marriage and you see someone else with a good marriage, you rather than rejoicing with them that they have a good marriage, you're jealous of them. You don't add, just like apply it to me personally. As a pastor, if I've got friends that are baptizing people every week and filling up the church and we're struggling to kind of make ends meet, just keep things going, keep the lights on, it'd be easy for me rather than rejoicing with that person to be like, I wish I had what they had, and why am I, why is this going on like this, to be jealous of them? No. Rejoice with them that we rejoice. And then, what about the weep with them that we, oh, unfortunately, we don't always rejoice with those rejoice. Very often, we are jealous of those that rejoice. But you know, also, weep with them that weep. Very often, when something bad happens to someone else, rather than weeping with them, we try to give them advice. Now, I'm not trying to say there isn't a time and a place, if you have the right relationship with someone, that they will try to look for you with, to you for advice, and they'll want help, and you can encourage them and give them some advice. I'm not saying there's no advice, but this passage commands us a sympathy mindset. So we should be happy when something good happens to someone else rather than being jealous. That's the rejoice with them, that the rejoice part. And then we should be sad when something bad happens to someone else rather than giving advice. Unfortunately, we all fall in this, don't you? Don't we? Don't I? What's your first thought when you hear somebody's having a problem? Well, here's what they should have done, or here's something they should do. Isn't that how our minds are? It's like we're an expert on everybody else. You remember that, the, the joke, I was years ago, I heard this, but you know that all the problems in the world would be solved if the neighbors would just swap kids? Because everybody knows what needs to be done with the neighbor kids, right? <laughs> Folks, um, there is a time and a place to help each other, to give advice. There is a time and a place um, to um, to think, oh, well, so-and-so is successful and maybe I'm struggling. Maybe there's something I could change or do different. But folks, our instant response, our knee-jerk instant response should be what? You come driving up to, to church in a Cadillac. I should be like, man, that's a beautiful car. I'm so excited for you. I should just be happy you have Cadillac. I should be like, well, I'm going to Dodge. No, <laughs> right? You know, isn't that the, the terrible deception of socialism is class envy? I'm happy that Elon Musk is worth $200 billion. I didn't lose any sleep last night when his stock price went up. Never when it went down. Folks, where did we get? Well, I know we, you know... <laughs> He wasn't content in the garden. She had she could eat any tree, but she had to have that one. She wasn't allowed that. We we have that, don't we? The desire for something that we can't have. The the insatiable uh, coveting for more, and we all do it. Not trying to pick on Eve. We all do it. But the Bible says, "Rejoice with them that do rejoice. Weep with them that weep." That's a mindset. A mindset God wants us to have. I shouldn't feel negative. And this is talking about people outside or inside the church. I shouldn't feel negative about my neighbor if things are going good for him. I should be happy for it. Just be happy. That's it. Nothing else. Nothing, nothing else is needed except rejoice with you. He doesn't need me thinking, ah. I can just be his friend and be happy for him. You know, I might get a chance to share the gospel. 
if I'm actually his friend and happy for him, but if I'm jealous of him because I think he got a special deal with somebody and then he was able, and I just start to go down that road of envy and jealousy. No, I should just be happy. So things are going good for somebody in the congregation. Just rejoice with them. That's all you need to do. Be thankful for what God has given you and rejoice with them. Rejoice with them. That rejoice. That's an important command. But the other part of it is just as important. Weep with those who weep. Listen, someone comes to church. Someone's going through a dark time and struggling in their life. You know, you should just be like, oh, I'm so sorry to hear that. Is there anything I can do to help? Anything I can do to encourage? Weep with those that weep. Now, there may come a time. The Bible says... First, take the beam out of your own eye. Then you'll see clearly to take the mold out of your brother's eye. So there's an order there. Work on your own stuff first. But there could come a time in the right time, the right place, the right relationship, where that person will be open to you getting the mold out of their eye. You may be able to help someone in the church, but first you have to take the beam out of your own eye. But you may be a helper. So I'm not saying there's not a time for advice. There is. But that's not, listen, we're talking about a mindset now. That's not our instant reaction. Our immediate instant reaction, especially before we know all the facts, should be, I'm so sorry, that you feel their pain and that you care, you genuinely care. And that's true in the church and outside the church. But we really need to do it outside the church too. We need to be have a sympathy mindset. So number one, a blessing mindset, that we would speak good words to others and desire what's best for others, even when they persecute us, no matter what, how they treat us. Goodwill, having goodwill toward others. And then number two, a sympathy mindset, that when someone, things are going good, that we're just happy for them, that things are going good. And when things go wrong, that our instant reaction isn't they must have done something wrong, like Job's friends, <laughs> that we're going to go try and fix it. Sympathy, a sympathy mindset. We need that. We need to have that, especially to our people outside the church. And then number three, a unity mindset. This does relate more to our to the church. It says this in verse 16. Be of the same mind one toward another. Mind not high things, but condescend to men of low estate. Be not wise in your own conceits. You know, unity is really a concept that almost nobody understands, that we all struggle to understand. Because unity means to be one, right? And yet we're all so different. I mean, unity in your marriage, that's tough. Unity in a family. Unity in the larger family. Unity in a church, that's tough. I mean, ever tried to create unity in America? <laughs> There's a tough one. We're not talking about that, though. In the Bible, talks about unity. It's talking about unity in the church. There's not going to ever be unity between saved and unsaved people. So it means being one. But listen, we're talking about a unity mindset, but here's why unity is confusing. I've said this before, unity is not uniformity. Unity and uniformity are actually opposites. The devil is all about uniformity. God is all about unity. Perfect example is my body. I came to church today and all the parts of my body are still here with me. I didn't leave any of the ones at home. They're all together. But you know, today I'm walking on my feet and I'm doing this and I'm singing with my voice and speaking with my voice and my eyes are looking at all of you. They're all different. That's not uniformity. I'm not all eyeballs or all a head or all an arm, all leg, all foot, right? Do you see how I'm one body, but I'm all different parts? That's unity. Unity means to be one. Uniformity is, una is one and form is a form a shape, a type. So uniformity means I, everybody's identical. That's what communism tries to produce. That's what socialism tries to produce. Everybody has to be the same. That's what Nazism is. We all speak the same, we do the same thing. We say Heil Hitler, we all march in step. The woke culture says we'll cancel you if you don't all say the same thing, believe the same thing, do the same thing. That's one of the reasons for the public school system, but especially the higher education college system. Get those professors in lockstep. You'll get canceled if you don't say exactly what you say. And all those professors say the exact same thing to all the students. And all the state students learn, I have to say the exact same things or I can't pass my class. And I won't be able to keep my job if I don't repeat all those same slogans. And I'd be like confronting people, say, Black Lives Matter. Well, maybe you do care about black lives. But they're trying to get everybody to say the same thing. And, 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 and then there's a certain meaning to it, too. It's not just the, the words, right? the meaning and the cancel culture today it's all a pressure of uniformity but that's not unity uniformity is the opposite of unity 
Because if you have identical forms, they don't need each other because they're all identical. You actually need each other when you're different. I don't need 5,000 hands, but I do need at least two hands. You know, one person said, the way we know evolution is true is because is not true because if evolution was true, that you develop the things that you need and the best things are preserved, then all moms would have three or four arms <laughs> because they really need more than two arms. But you know what? I have thousands of blood vessels in my body and I need them all. I have thousands of nerves. I have all of the different parts of my body doing all different things. I need all those things. I need an eye to see where I'm going, but I need a foot so that I can go where I'm going, right? We have all different needs. And so we're supposed to have a unity mindset. And it says this, be of the same mind one toward another. Okay, that's the unity he's talking about, that we should be of the same mind. Well, Pastor Hunter, this person over here is Catholic, and this person here is Calvinist, this person is Arminian, this person over here is Lutheran, this person over here is Baptist. And the Baptists are the ones often that struggle the most to get along. <laughs> there's, a, there's a saying, it's kind of a joke, but it's not really a joke. If there's a good Baptist church in one town, just wait, pretty soon there'll be two. <laughs> it's true. And it's really not a joke, but it's kind of something to say kind of funny, making, you know, the Baptists are so opinionated and they have all different beliefs and they have trouble getting along. But you know what? What does he mean when he says be of the same mind one to another? He's not actually saying that we all believe exactly the same thing. That's uniformity. In fact, the Apostle Paul says very clearly in chapter 14, let every man, one man believes this, another man believes that, let every man be fully persuaded in his own mind. He never says that you should have to all believe the exact same thing. But he does say we have to be of the same mind. That's why I'm talking about the mindset of the body. Now I'll give you an example of this. All the parts of my body are different. And my ear doesn't understand my eye. My eye doesn't understand my ear because they have different functions. They don't really agree. But my ear doesn't see the world the way my eye does. But you know what? My eye doesn't hear the world the way my ear does. They're different. They're different. So what is a unity mindset? Well, he said be of the same mind one toward another. That would be talking about in church and between God's people. So one toward another. It's not that my attitude toward you is that you have to believe just like me. No, it's that my attitude toward you is I need you because you're a member of the body. And you look at me and say, you need me because I'm a member of the body. We're of the same mind one toward another. But there's another part of that too. If you believe this book is true, and I believe this book is true, and this book says our main purpose of being here is sharing the gospel. Now we are united. We may have different beliefs on a lot of things, but we agree that the Bible is the authority and it's above our opinion. And we believe that we are here to reach the world of the gospel. Now we're of the same mind. That's one mindset. So even though my eye and my ear are different, yet they both helped me to get to church this morning. My eye and my ear were of the same mind one toward another even though they're different. And the all the different members of my body, even they have all different opinions about how to do things because they have all different gifts and abilities. <laughs> about, you know what they all did? They all focus on feeding me, getting me up in the morning, taking care of me, protecting me from harm, and getting me where I need to go so that I can do what I need to do. That's the body of Christ. The body of Christ is we're all different, but we should be all of the same mind, one to another, which means I know I need you. You know you need me. We agree that the Bible is the authority. That's our connection to the head, Jesus Christ, it's through the word of God. And then we all agree on our mission, which is to reach the world with the gospel. That's unity. It's not our opinions on the other subjects. That's not unity. Listen, your opinion, opinions. If you are a normal Christian, your opinions on many subjects will change over the course of your life. My opinion on many subjects has changed over the course of my life. Probably once a week, I change my view on something in the Bible. Because I'm constantly in the Word of God, constantly listening, constantly reading, constantly studying. I see new things I never saw before. That's not the point. It's not our individual opinions or my individual opinion. But it is that we are under the authority of the Word of God and that we have the same goal. We know we need each other, so we're not going to let the little differences divide us. But also we know that our purpose here, and this is the body, the mindset of the body, our purpose here is to reach the world with the gospel. So now when we say, hey, should we take on a missionary? Everybody goes, yeah, we want to reach the world with the gospel. Hey, should we 
Uh, you know, someday we have uh, money for a building. Should we build a building so that people can come and people we talk about it? Well, can we afford this? And is it a good thing, good location? We talk about all the details of that, how we want it to look, all those things. And we could say, yeah, let's do this. This will be a tool to reach our community with the gospel. Because when you have your own building, you have a lot more freedom to do a lot more ministries. And people drive by and they see that building and they go, well, that's where Dells Baptist meets. And then they come visit you. And they're not looking around. Are they, are they at the community center now? Or did COVID hit and are they at the park? Or now are they here? Now, I'm not complaining about that. That's the season we're in. And, and the Lord is blessing in that's this season. But they can come a point where we can agree on that. And if we agree together that that will that every every decision that we make if we agree together that that will further the gospel we'll have no trouble agreeing on what we're going to do and if we can't agree that it's going to spread the gospel a particular decision we want to make well maybe we shouldn't make it then if we can't agree we have plenty to work on that we do agree with we don't have to take a bunch of time focusing on things we don't agree with so a unity mindset be of the same mind one toward another mind not high things but condescend to men of lowest state as kind of thinking that, well, you know, I'm higher up and I know more and I don't care about this person's opinion. Be not wise in your own conceits. Don't have too high of an opinion of your opinion. I have a few statements that to me summarizes the unity mindset. Because our unity is around the word of God. When the Bible is our focus, we have less disagreements over subjects not mentioned in the Bible. That's true, isn't it? See, if we sat down here and we didn't open the Bible, and we said, okay, we're going to start with Kaylee over there. I'm going to move our way over across the back and forth. And I want everybody to tell me your opinion on politics and your opinion on sports and your opinion on clothing and your parent opinion on music and your opinion. Oof. We would walk away going, we're not compatible. <laughs> <laughs> and everybody gets to talk equal amounts. And so the quiet people are feeling pressured to talk. And then the loud people are feeling restricted. And just go on and on and on. And who likes this kind of cl cl clothes, food, or whatever? We're going to walk away going, man, there's no way we could ever get along again if we did that. But see, that's not our focus, is it? Listen, when the Bible is our focus, we have less disagreement over subjects not mentioned in the Bible. You know me. I'm talkative, and I have opinion about every subject. You talk to me about this, well, I heard, I read an article about this, or I studied this, or in the Greek, and the Hebrew, well, you know me, a history... I have opinions about everything, but you know those opinions don't matter? God's not impressed with any of my knowledge. You might be, but I'm, God isn't. God isn't impressed. So, I better not be impressed either. But you know what? All of those subjects, I have opinions because I think about that stuff. i got a weird brain. I think about all kinds of stuff all the time. Analyze it every time. My wife, is, she was talking about it yesterday. Yesterday I'm sitting on the couch now. I think I printed out... Let's see. Um, was it six times? Forty, thirty. Anyway, I printed out like over a thousand sheets of paper. Twelve hundred, three, thirteen hundred, fourteen hundred sheets of paper that are in those books. And so I'm sitting there, you know, and I was up late on on Saturday night, and then. And, and then I'm talking about different things, and then I'm taking the people down there, the young people down there, and then I'm working my sermon and all that. And my wife's just like, she's like, you're just like, your brain is always like, and you're doing all these different things. And <laughs> she's, like, she's like, I don't understand you. Like, <laughs> what kind of person you are. And I am. She's like, I think I don't want to get migraine headaches. <laughs> she said, your brain is so busy thinking all the time, and you just get overloaded. Your brain can't handle it. And it's <laughs> If my brain's giving me a break, I'm going to get my name. But um, I'm only using me as a very extreme illustration. I've got opinions about everything. And by the way, my opinions on those subjects are actually different than they were like five, ten years ago. But you know what? None of that stuff really matters. All that really matters is what the Bible says. And so when the Bible is our focus, we have less disagreement over subjects not mentioned in the Bible. If it's not mentioned in the Bible, you're welcome to it, and you may even be right. If it's not mentioned in the Bible, I'm welcome to have an opinion, and I may even be right on a few of them. That's possible. But you know what? If we're focusing on the Bible, if what we're discussing isn't in the Bible, like football, it's not in the Bible. So your opinion on football, my opinion, it doesn't really matter. 
It doesn't matter if you love Aaron Rodgers, you hate Aaron Rodgers, you love the Bears. It doesn't matter. It doesn't make any difference because it's not in the Bible. But when it relates to the Bible, that's different. That's different. So uh, when the Bible is our focus, we have less disagreement over subjects not mentioned in the Bible. That's the first statement about having a unity mindset. Here's the second. It relates to the verse, to the phrase, mind not high things, but condescend to men of low estate. Don't think I'm way up here and I'm too good for that person down there. No, go the people who are hurting and struggling and who are maybe you think they're lower class than you or whatever it is. Go and spend time with and be with those people. Condescend to men of low estate. When the, listen, when the Bible is our focus, we will reach out to others instead of looking down on them. And that all relates to the unity, doesn't it? When the Bible is our focus, we're going to have less disagreement about subjects not mentioned in the Bible. When the Bible is our focus, we will reach out to others instead of looking down on them. Why? Because the Bible says, hey, uh, reach out to those people. Rejoice them, rejoice. Weep with them that weep, right? So you're going to love people. You're going to try to help them because the Bible is your focus. And also, number three, uh, in that section there, when the Bible, I'm going to confuse you by saying numbers and then they're not, right? This is just within the unity mindset. When the Bible is our focus, we will see that God is wise and we are not. Because what does it say? Be not wise in your own conceits. God does not care that I read the Bible in Hebrew and Greek. He couldn't care less. God is a lot, lot smarter than me. Be not wise in your own conceits. When we read the Bible, we go, oh, wait, actually, I don't really know very much. <laughs> Because you read the Bible and you realize, man, I'm so far behind in who I should be as a Christian, as a person, and what God wants me to know. And a lot of this stuff, I don't understand it. When the Bible is our focus, we will see that God is wise and we are not. And that will help us not to be wise in our own conceit, not to have a high opinion of our opinion. A blessing mindset, a sympathy mindset, a unity mindset, and then a meekness mindset. This is to be our mindset when we try to reach the world. Verse 17, a meekness mindset. Look what it says here. Recompense to no man evil for evil. Provide things honest in the sight of all men. That first part. Recompense to no man, man evil for evil. Somebody is mean to you. Don't be mean back to them. This isn't talking about self-defense or standing up for your constitutional rights. That's There's a biblical basis for that. We're just talking about interpersonal relationships, people that you know, People that you, uh, friends, relatives, co-workers, neighbor, neighbor, neighbors, sometimes our neighbors are like neighbor. Um, you know, at work, I have people that I struggle to get along with. But I just found out that I hide it well. <laughs> I vent to all of you. No. <laughs> but uh, just, there's this one guy that Justin and I both work with. And, and he's someone that, in, in all fairness, he's someone that everybody struggles to get along with there. And he... He's come very close to getting fired several times. But anyway, uh, Justin calls me over on Friday when I first started working. He goes, hey, you know what? This guy, I'm not going to say his name. You know what this guy said? I said, what? He said he misses you because he's not working with you anymore because he's working a different shift. <laughs> and I said, really? He goes, yeah. He's like, oh, where's that guy? I miss him. And I'm thinking, I must have really hid my dislike. <laughs> For him really well. Was that maybe like a fake politician? I don't know. I was trying to figure it out. But I was actually surprised that he said that, you know. I wish I could say the same for him. No. But anyways, <laughs> I know that the Lord put me with him for a reason, and I did get to share the gospel with him a few times, and I've tried to show the love of Christ, but inwardly there are times where it's really hard and it just has to do with the way he acts, the way he confronts me and tries to boss me around, and he has no authority. Just a lot of things like that are hard for me. But in those situations, hey, if if a person like that comes up to you and says certain mean things to you, and then there's another situation where it's all flipped around and maybe that person's in trouble, they, you know how tempting it would be to go up to that person and just say the right thing to kind of grind them back into the dust the way they ground you to dust. You know, don't we do it in marriage? We're having a discussion, just a discussion, right, back and forth. And one spouse brings up something that you did at some time a thousand years ago, but they still remember. Just kidding. And then you think of something that they did. Yeah, I'm already feeling guilty, but that's recompensing evil for evil. Well, we got to keep this even here. While we're talking about what you did, we got to talk about what I did. We got to talk about what you did. Don't recompense evil for evil. Don't try to pay somebody back for what they did. A meekness mindset. That's what meekness actually means. Meekness means I'm not focused on my rights and getting my way 
and things going the way I want. That's meekness. But then he says this, provide things honest in the sight of all men. And I have some of these statements about this. When we are focused on our own rights, we will want to punish others for violating our rights. That's what we're going to want to do. And that's the recompensing evil for evil. But then also, when we focus on punishing others, because he says this, provide things honest in the sight of all men. When we focus on punishing others, we end up doing things that hurt our testimony, don't we? Because when I just start paying somebody back what they did to me, you know what I've become? I've become exactly like unsaved people. They're not going to be able to see any difference between me and a, a non-Christian. They're not going to see any difference between like, Christians are just a bunch of hypocrites. They act like they're better, but they're just the same as everybody else. When it says provide things honest, this is something I um, learned more recently, but in the King James Bible, when it uses the word honest, it actually means honorable. We use the word honest today in a different meaning than the real meaning of the word honor and honest. You can tell how it's the same root meaning. It actually means honorable. And I guess it's honorable to be honest. That's why we use it that way. And in the King James Bible, in what we would say honest, it would say truthful. It wouldn't use the word honest like we do. It wouldn't say, or we would say no hypocrisy. That's how we would use it. It would not say honest to refer to being truthful. We use the word honest now for like truthful, but at that time, the word honest actually meant honorable. So it says, provide things honest in the sight of all men. It's saying this, be careful not to deteriorate into paying somebody back evil for evil because now you are going to start behaving in a way that creates a bad testimony. It's just a feud between you and that person and now you're a bad testimony. And that's not honorable in the sight of all men. Think about your reputation. To provide things honest in the sight of all men means to think about what would be the honorable thing to do and how our actions will affect our reputation. See, the mindset of the body is thinking about our mission and how people perceive us and make sure we're behaving in the right way. And part of that is the meekness mindset because when we get into defending our rights and fighting for our rights and paying somebody back for what they did to us, what ends up happening is we lose our testimony. And now... We've lost the mindset of the body that we're here to win people to Christ. Easy to fall into, but very important to be careful about. And then a peace mindset, verse 18. If it be possible, as much as lieth in you, live peaceably with all men. I've always said this. I'm so thankful that those, for, those two qualifications are before that. Aren't you? Can you imagine it just said live peaceably with all men? That's impossible. That's why it says, if it be possible, as much as lieth in you, live peaceably with all men. There are people that you'll never get along with because they have decided that they're never... Now, that someday God could do a miracle, change their heart, or something could happen, and they could freely choose to change their mind. But you're not going to make them change. That responsibility can't be on you. You can try to be the best person you know how to be, but if they just decide to hate you, there's nothing they're going to do. You know, If you're a pro-life Republican, a pro-choice Democrat is never going to like you. <laughs> they're not going to like you. Because they see you as taking away this right they think that they have to murder their own baby. And they're not going to like you. Now, that might not make any sense to you or me, but that's reality. They're like, as long as you're standing in between me and an abortion, I'm going to hate you. It's the way they think. That's not your fault because you're standing for biblical truth and what's right. And not even biblical. It's just obvious that abortion is murder. Even unsaved people can understand abortion is murder. And so there's nothing you can do about that. So either they'll have to change their view or they'll have to just decide to be nice to you. But you're not going to cause them to be at peace. That's why it says, if it be possible, as much as lieth in you, live peaceably with all men. It is not always possible to be at peace with someone, but peace should always be our goal. See, we're talking about a mindset. We're not talking about something magical that it just happens. We're talking about how we think. And listen, how can we win people to Christ if we're not focused on getting along with people? We have to focus on getting along with people as we win them to Christ. But there will it's getting along with people without compromise. You can't compromise biblical truth in order to get along with someone because now you've lost the whole mission because if you're just like them, then what are you winning them to? So you do have to be uh, different than the world. But your focus should always be trying to get along with people so you can have an opportunity to give them the gospel. That's a peace mindset. And then there's a trust mindset, verse 19. We're almost done here. Dearly beloved, avenge not yourselves, but rather give place unto wrath. For it is written, vengeance is mine, I will repay, saith the Lord. Now why do I call that a trust mindset? Well, what does it say? Don't avenge yourself, but give place unto wrath. For it is written, vengeance is mine, I will repay, 
So that passage is saying the reason, and this is something I missed for many years, many years of my life, I always thought God's just telling me, just don't, just don't take revenge, just forgive. Just don't take revenge, just forgive. Just drop it, let it go, it doesn't matter. But that's actually not what he's saying. It's saying you stay out of the way so God can deal with them. That's what the passage is actually saying. It doesn't say, here's how we read it. <clears throat> Dearly beloved, avenge not yourself because vengeance is bad. <clears throat> that's kind of how we think, isn't it? But that's not what the passage says. It says, Dearly beloved, avenge not yourself, but rather give place unto wrath. Now, some modern translations translate that wrong. And that's one of the reasons why I missed the meaning of that passage several, many times. A lot of modern translations translate it as giving place unto wrath means just getting rid of your wrath. But it, the, if you study giving place to something, if, um, if I want Gregory to stand here, I can't stand here. So I have to give place to Gregory and move out of the way so Gregory can go stand there. I'm giving place to Gregory. So when the Bible says, don't avenge yourself, but give place unto wrath, it's saying, step out of the way so God's wrath can come. Give place for God's wrath. Because it's written, vengeance is mine, I will repay, saith the Lord. If Evelyn is doing something wrong, my kids are not a very good example anymore because they're all grown up. So but back in the day, <laughs> 10 years ago, if Evelyn was doing something wrong, and Gregory's like, well, I'm going to get her back. Well, you know what's going to happen? Gregory's going to get a worse punishment, and Evelyn may or may not even get punished, depending on the severity of what she did, because Gregory is taking on himself to be mean to his sister. But if Evelyn is doing something wrong, and Gregory says, hey, Dad, Evelyn's doing something wrong, and then he just kind of steps out of the way. Now he is not blocking my wrath, and now my wrath is going to be on Evelyn. And you understand, I'm not talking about being out of control, but uh, justice and punishment. That's what the Bible's talking about. So in the same way, when you try to avenge yourself, you're blocking the wrath of God. When you step out of the way, okay, now God's wrath can come. That's what it means. And what is required for Gregory to come to me and not try to take vengeance on Evelyn himself? Trust. What is required for you to step out of the way when you see something, another Christian doing something wrong and say, okay, God, you take care of this. Trust. You have to believe that God will take vengeance because he promises it. Vengeance is mine. Let me see. I will repay. Is that a promise? That's a promise. But you know what you and I, our problem is, Gregory's like, I don't think Dad's going to really punish Evelyn the way she should be, so I'm going to do it for him. But now he's in big trouble because he's trying to be me, and I don't let anybody else be me. When you try to take revenge yourself, you're trying to be God. And you know what? God says he doesn't share his glory with another. Now you are in trouble with God because you're trying to get revenge. Vengeance is mine. I will repay. But you know what's required? Gregory has to trust me that I will deal appropriately with Evelyn. I have to trust God that he will deal appropriately with that person if I'm going to step out of the side and get away. So you know what's required as Christians? Hey, you look at what's going on in our country and you have friends and relatives, neighbors and coworkers who are mean to you. Do you believe that God will take care of that? You got to believe that. You know, God will take care of you. Not maybe the way you want him to, but the proper way. And even if nothing changes in this life, someday every knee shall bow and every tongue will confess that Jesus Christ is Lord. Think of that verse we're memorizing. Father Abraham. Think about that rich man and Lazarus. When Lazarus, the dogs are licking his sores and he's taking the crumbs that fall from the rich man's table. And what if Lazarus thought, this is so cruel and mean. I'm here starving to death. And that rich man could just hand me some of his food, and he won't. And so I'm going to go kill that rich man, because I'm so angry at him, because I'm a socialist. Rich people are bad. But you know what happened? Lazarus trusted in God. What happens in the next life? Lazarus is comforted in the bosom of Abraham. And what does the rich man say? Send Lazarus. 
to dip his finger in water and cool my tongue. You know why we need to be thinking about that? That'll make you pray for Joe Biden and Kamala Harris. Because you don't want that to happen. Vengeance is mine. I will repay. You pray for them. They might get saved. And that will happen to them. Can you imagine? You could be Kamala Harris's buddy in heaven. That could happen. Well, that would never happen. Yeah, that's what they said about the Apostle Paul. He ain't never going to be our buddy. The Apostle Paul. And we go, wow, Apostle Paul. We're going to see him in heaven someday. Yeah. God can change anyone. Nobody's beyond the grace of God. A trust mindset. Do you trust God with those who are in authority? Do you trust God with the people around you? Friends, relatives, neighbors, neighbors, coworkers who are mean to you? Or do you say, I'm going to get revenge. I'm going to pay them back. Avenge not yourself. Give place unto wrath. We should trust in God to bring justice rather than trying to bring justice ourselves. Number seven, a mercy mindset. Almost done. Therefore, if thy enemy hunger... <laughs> Feed him. If he thirsts, give him drink. For in so doing, thou shalt heap coals of fire on his head. If your enemy's hungry, feed him. What does it mean by your enemy? It's not saying that if somebody, some terrorist organization is threatening our country, we need to go feed them and let them cut our heads off. No, we need to go protect our country. That's not what we're talking about. Enemies in the Bible is not talking about enemies of a country that you are supposed to. The country is the minister of God who bears the sword, like we celebrate on Remembrance Day. That's a good thing. We don't go feed Hitler. We go kill him because he's killing everybody else and we bear the sword. All right? That's not what he's talking about here. Enemy is a person that you have trouble getting along with, a person who's mean to you. That's what it means by enemy. If thine enemy hunger, feed him. If he thirst... Give him drink. For in so doing, thou shalt heap coals of fire on his head. That's a mercy mindset. Have mercy. If someone's hungry and you feed them, you're having mercy on them. If somebody is thirsty and you give them water, you're having mercy on them. Have a mercy mindset. We as Christians, we need to have mercy on our enemies, on people who are against us. Because we're not fighting against flesh and blood anyway. The devil is our real enemy. The Bible tells us to love our enemies, but you know, love is not a feeling, is it? It's not about how you feel about that person. It's about meeting their needs. Love is a choice to meet the spiritual, emotional, and physical needs of others. Again, we're not talking about enemies in war. We're talking about people that you have trouble getting along with. If they're hungry, feed them. If they're thirsty, give them drink. Loving is not a feeling. It's a choice to meet the spiritual, emotional, and physical needs of others. Share the gospel with those that you don't get along with. Be sympathetic and kind to those you don't get along with. And meet their physical needs if they have physical needs. Strong Concordance describes this way, the coals of fire. It says it's a proverbial expression signifying to call up by favors you confer on your enemy the memory in him of the wrong he has done. So in other words, when someone's being mean to you and you meet their needs and you're kind to them, you know what it causes them to do? It's painful for them. It's They remember the bad things they did to you while you were nice to them. It is a way of showing them mercy, a mercy mindset. And then last of all, a victory mindset. It says, be not overcome of evil, but overcome evil with good. I was looking at this and I went, wow. It's something we really, really need in America today. Be not overcome of evil, but overcome evil with good. Now here, I want, you to explain, I want to explain to you what that means. When we respond wrong to difficult circumstances and difficult people, we have become overcome by evil. So somebody is be, doing something wrong to us, and if we respond wrong, you know what's happening? We've been overcome by evil. Because that situation, the devil's tempting us to do the wrong thing. And when we do the wrong thing, guess who won? The devil. Guess who lost us? We were overcome by evil. It says, be not overcome of evil, but overcome evil with good. See, we need a victory mindset. See, we have this defeat mindset. We're just like, well, we're living in America, 2021. Everything's going downhill. <sighs> Down the drain. We get a defeat mindset. The Bible says you need to have a victory 
mindset. Be not overcome of evil. Overcome evil is good. But see, we don't know what the victory is. We think the victory is when all those people leave everybody alone, leave us alone, or God strikes them all with lightning. That's victory. Yeah. That's not victory. Victory is when you overcome the devil. Because the devil is tempting you to do wrong through those people being mean to you. <coughs> That's why it says, be not overcome of evil, but overcome evil with good. We need a victory mindset. Did you know that you can have the victory? Did you know that when Stephen was stoned, and he said, lay not the sin to their charge, he was overcoming evil with good. He won. No, Stephen lost because he was stoned. No, he won. Because they were not able to overcome him. He died, he went to heaven, he got his reward, he won. And the Apostle Paul ended up getting saved through his testimony. And there was a great persecution because of Stephen, and it went everywhere, and people all over heard the gospel because of the persecution. Stephen won by losing because he was not overcome with evil. Listen, the danger in America today is not that you're going to get persecuted or imprisoned or beaten or killed or tortured. That's not the danger. The danger is that you're going to get angry and respond wrong and wreck your testimony. That you're going to get divorced. That you're going to do something wrong. That you are going to be overcome of evil. That's the danger. So we got the wrong focus. This is a spiritual battle. And the question is, are you going to hold out and be a good testimony as a Christian, no matter what happens to you? Or are you going to let that evil overcome you? Be not overcome of evil, overcome evil with good. When we respond wrong to difficult circumstances and difficult people, we have been overcome by evil. When we obey God and focus on our own responsibility, we have won the spiritual battle in that situation. You can overcome evil with good. Wait, Pastor, how do I overcome evil with good? You keep on obeying God no matter what other people do to you. You keep on obeying God no matter what every, everybody around you is obeying God. You keep on doing right and obeying God no matter what the culture says, no matter what the culture does. And you know what you just did? You just overcame. That's how they overcame in the Bible. They didn't take over the Roman Empire and defeat it. And it's actually they did years later. But that's a history lesson for another day. But they did not go and take over the Roman Empire. They simply were faithful unto death and they were given a crown of life. That's how they overcame we need to have the right mindset, and we need to understand that God wants us to focus on winning the lost, and focus on getting along with others, and focus on loving our enemies, and desiring and blessing our enemies, and desiring to win them for Christ, and to be faithful, no matter how much the culture puts us, on, puts us under pressure, and no matter how people attack us, that we always respond according to how God tells us to respond. We're going to close with 611 in your white hymn book. The beauty of Jesus, and this song is about <clears throat> us becoming like Jesus.